followers either, but uh, then I, I haven't showed you their pictures. And girls, John never gets to hear the music before we play it on the show because I'd like to get his off the cuff, you know, un, unspoiled gut reaction. So uh, he has ne- he he didn't even know your names until you talked to him. So <laughs> this is all <laughs> all spur of the moment for him. But uh, we are so happy to have you here with us today. I want you to jump in here, girls, and uh, I- I'm not going to referee. You guys can do the uh, you guys can do your own refereeing. But tell us a little bit about the history of Soulful Them. You first, Cheryl. Go ahead. Put your two okay. in. <laughs> in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Um, we met six years ago at a um, at a Women of Blues uh, revival concert, and I heard Stevie sing, and I asked the guys in the band that we had put together, would you guys like to back her up? And, and that's how we uh, started working together as a five-piece. And while we had the five-piece, we decided, why don't we do some duo work? We think that would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And so... What we did was we just took the music that we played with the five piece and we played it as a duo. And I have to tell you, um, it kind of just took off from when we from the beginning. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's, I'm it's not surprised right at all. So I, you guys I was have been surprised. <laughs> well, <laughs> pleasantly, I'm surprised. sure. You guys have been together now how long? It's about six years. About six years, yeah. Six. Yeah. Okay, years. and is is this your first full length album? As a duo, yes. Yes. Uh, we okay. had we, we now we had the, a five piece and we named it my my it was called the Stevie Wellens Band, and um, we had a, 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 a did a CD. Um, that was a I guess we did a CD with mm-hmm. Cheryl and I, of course. And with the other members of the Stevie Wellens band, and it was a different CD altogether. And um, um, it was blues, of course, but this right. one, um, this one is a little bit more dear to our hearts because it was Cheryl and I are um, we just had a vision, and and uh, uh, the 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 name of the CD, of course, you know, it is well with my soul. Right. And I guess that was the part of that that set us on our our uh, on our way to doing the CD. So, well, you you Thanks sure so. done a knockout on it. I know. I got the luckily I got the whole CD, so I also yeah. got to sit and pick which tracks we were going to use. And uh, I picked this one because I thought it would be a great segment opener. And I have to be honest, I am going to tease the listeners a little bit because I want them to get the album themselves and hear for themselves. So I'm going to play the short track of the title tune from the album when we finish chatting here. And I think it's only, what, it's about a minute and a half long or something. But I know I've got listeners out there that love this music, and I want to just tease them a little bit, make them go get the album to listen to the full version of it. How did you happen to decide to do a a short track of it to begin the album and then the uh, longer track to close it. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> well, we had decided to call the album it as well with my soul, which right. is a uh, an older hymn, and we actually got the idea to bookend the album from um, someone that we were going to work with, um, mm-hmm. and a doctor of music and the Pittsburgh Choral Group, and that's where we kind of got the idea. And, you know, then COVID hit, and I guess that explains a lot of everybody's story. But we decided, yes, we think and what I wanted to hear at the beginning was just Stevie and then the organ coming in, the church organ. And then on the outro, I wanted kind of the opposite, the church organ, then Stephanie, and then the choral group. So mm. that's kind of where it came from. We took it from there. And I think we've gotten so many uh, comments and compliments on the fact that this album is bookended by that hymn. Yes, yeah. It, and was, what's in, in between is, is, is a thing. The, the intro and outro is so important, but what's in between 
is um, exactly. I, I yeah, guess it's, that's our yeah, that's our heart and our soul is in there. It's an impressive uh, piece of work. And uh, speaking of piece of work, I think we got to run down off the ceiling fan there, John. You got a question for us? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, you you hit on something, uh, ladies, just a second ago about. Um, the, the the gospel influence. I, you didn't use that word, but I, I'm going to use that word. Okay. And uh, and a lot of people that are into the blues also do have some kind of not everybody, but they have some kind of a gospel uh, or religious music background to them. Uh, so my question actually is kind of twofold. First of all, if you do have that influence, you know, how did it come to you? And then secondly. Um, which is pretty much a generic standard question that I ask everybody, who are the major influences musically in your lives? Wow. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, let's see. As far as um, gospel influences, I, I was not brought up in the church. Um, however, I did go at times just for the music and it was just wonderful music of course and and listening to other um gospel greats uh listening to them say and 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 the fact that a lot of the music the r&b the blues is born out of gospel spiritual music and a lot of people need should realize that and the 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 feel of the music that makes you feel something in your heart the blues, gospel, even the R and B. I mean, you listen to the other the artists such as um, Gladys Knight for one. Mm-hmm. Definitely the songs that she sings, and you know she was, and she did do gospel. And but mm-hmm. you could feel the. I mean, Midnight Train of Georgia just just put me just under the table, man. Listen to her sing that, okay? But you could feel that that feeling, that soulful feeling in her voice, that um, the the gospel feel in her voice. Definitely. Um, but it, but influences it's it's so hard to choose. I have I have so many influences growing up, coming up. A lot of male vocalists. I was mentioning to someone else that Stevie Wonder was my. I would say he was the first one that made me think that he was a kid doing fingertips. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute, he's doing this. I can do it. <laughs> okay, and because you didn't see that too many kids doing that at that time. Um back in the 60s, I guess, and right. except for, and you get Michael Jackson, but, they, but Stevie came first, Stevie Wonder, they came before, he came first, Absolutely. and yes. I, yes, so I, for me anyway, and listening to him, uh, and the way he made me feel when he sang, every time he sang, I would actually literally almost be in tears, hearing him do fingertips, because like his voice is just wonderful, just, it was happy, and mm-hmm. it was it was good, and um, so that was my first influence. And then from there, it was like I I go tell someone else. It's like you know trying to ask me to eat one potato chip. <laughs> like, there's okay. so many. There's so many. <laughs> I know it's hard. It's and so people, difficult. When, yeah. That's, it's, yeah, it's it is. Favorite. Yeah, it's unless like, you've you... had one major influence. It's really hard to tell because you do have so many. I mean, everything that everything that you're surrounded by as you're growing up, and especially in your formative yeah. years, is an influence. Mm-hmm. And it's often mm-hmm. hard to be able to sit and pinpoint, well, this person especially. And uh, that's there is no wrong answer to that question. So uh, no. the only thing that I can say is, John, you took away my next question because <laughs> I was going to go into their background. Not necessarily. And I'm glad, to, glad to do it for you. you too. About the fans Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, I, I wasn't going to steal your question about the muse, but uh, I was <laughs> going to go into their background. And since we have already done that, girls, there's a lot of talk today, especially more so than in the, uh, in ages past about women in music, the reputation, or I'm sorry, not reputation, but the, uh, the number of women who are making it in music and how far they go. The, the whole, the, the whole thing. As a matter of fact, we had a uh, girl from Canada on here a couple of weeks ago, Susie Corey, who is doing a series of, uh, of drive-in concerts where, uh, she is trying very 
intentionally to balance the representation of male and female so that you don't have all male and you don't go too much the other way and have all female, but have it kind of balanced. What is what would you say is your advice to women who want to get into the music game business, whatever you want to call it? We've had a lot of discussion about it being a business too, but uh, what would you say to a young girl who came up to you and said, you know, I really love what you do. And, you know, it's the age old, this is what I want to be when I grow up line. What would you tell them? Go, Cheryl. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, I can say, well, no, no. Honestly, because when I grew up and I started playing guitar, that was not heard of. That was unheard of back then. So right. I, was a, I was kind of a pioneer in that sense that way uh and a lot of people you know had said why don't you play piano why don't you sing because i don't sing i don't play piano i play guitar and i don't play acoustic guitar i play electric guitar i never played an acoustic guitar and a lot of people said well why don't you do this or why don't you do that and i just followed uh, and the advice i would give was follow the voice in your head and in your heart if, if that's what you want to do, if that's the instrument that you choose, that you identify with, then stick with it. And that's kind of what I did. Um, and many of the women guitarists that I now know and love and admire kind of have the same story um, where, you know, it, like I said, back when I did it, it was unheard of. So I, my advice would be, A, do what's in your heart, B, just as important, learn the music business because it is a business. It is a business. It is. It is a, it I, is a business. And, and the, the thing about, about it being a business is that, you know, you have to put the love of it first because if you don't, if you don't put the love of the business before the business of the business, then you're probably going to fail at it. But however, if you also put the business of the business before the love, you're going to fail at it. So you have to find a balancing point. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. That's exactly exactly right. Um, There, you know, when I guess coming up, I, you know, I, 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 playing guitar would have been really nice. But you know, like I was listening to um, Sister Rosetta Thorpe. Thorpe, she's wonderful. She's wonderful. Yeah. She played guitar. She played. She she played guitar, and this was way back. Way back, yeah. yeah, but then I listened to to Jimi Hendrix, and I fell in love with him. Like I said, influence, you know, one of my uh, another influence. But guitar wasn't my thing. I just listened to the the the, the way they play and singing to the guitar, you know, singing the notes. You know, Jimi Hendrix, and mm-hmm. you know, that she just and she played and she sang. I would just liked hearing the voices and hearing the voices on the instruments and. Um, I, I actually, I teach, well, I, I'm a vocal coach. Oh, okay. And I'm, ad, I'm an adjunct professor at, um, the community college here. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I say, and I coach, uh, other vocalists, male and female vocalists. And I tell them, I, I, I tell them this is not an easy business for anybody. No. But I said, if, if this, this is something that you want to do. Take it as far as you can take it. Learn as much as you can. Learn everything. Like Phil said, the business of the music business. There's music and the business part. And they don't usually don't teach you that in school. No, they don't. This is true. So you need to uh, to have a course. (laughs) We've touched on that many times with many of the guests we've had on the show. As a matter of fact, I have a recurring feature that we do periodically uh, as the situation warrants when I'll be in touch with somebody that is a uh, a teacher advisor or some professional position within the music business. Uh, we had a gentleman on here a couple of weeks ago, uh, Durrell Pert, who is a, uh, he's a consultant to uh, uh, musicians, uh, emerging talent. And that was one of the points that he stressed that you've got to, you've got to take the fact that, it's called a music business for a reason. There are two parts to it. There is the music and there is the business. And you've got to learn both parts 
and learn how to deal with both parts successfully. 